Hello, can anyone hear me on the English channel? Okay, so we're just trying to test the, the audio. Great. Okay, you can hear. Anna, here. Good evening. My name is Mozan Hassan. I'm the executive director for Nazra for Feminist Studies. Nazra is an organization, an Egyptian organization, uh, working on continuation sustainability of the feminist movement in Egypt and the Arab region. I'm one of the founders of the Caucus for Women Politicians in the Egyptian who is organizing this um, meeting today. I'm just going to tell you a bit about uh, the caucus until um, Bushra Belhaj um, joins us. It's just one logistical issue that I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention. So for those who um, need to hear the interpretation in, in, uh, uh, in English, please click on English. But for those who would like to listen to the meeting in Arabic, please click on German. No, enter the German channel for Arabic and the English channel for English. The English bot. Uh, the Caucus for Women Politicians in the Arab Region is an initiative that was uh, uh, that started with a group of women from the Arab Region, and by the Arab Region I mean uh, the the region that uh, predominantly speaks Arabic as an, as the main language, uh, including. Uh, different religions, sects, um, and, and groups of people existing in this uh, region, the variety of people. The caucus started off as an idea in 2014 as a result of Nazra's interest in the issue of political participation of women in Egypt for, uh, for a long time and um, the participation of a group of women in, in the region and the idea um, uh, it came to life uh, with a group of um, women who are active in politics in the Arab region around whether there's a possibility for, for women to, to gather and to work together around the issues of women in politics in the Arab region. And then, thankfully, the, the idea uh, was uh, welcomed by many and the caucus came to life. Uh, the caucus defines politics in its broad terms as the participation in the public sphere. The caucus gathers uh, women who are members of the parliament, from uh, those who have participated in drafting constitutions in their countries, women uh, who are active in different fields in their countries, women, women who are active in the academia and civil society organizations, uh, women who, who are part of causes and, and, and struggles and issues and who are active in politics in general. The idea of the caucus and its work and all the past past years um, revolved around gathering women to discuss the feminist agenda for the Arab region because, uh, because there are a lot of women speaking about politics in the region, but the, the, but the gender aspect of, of this issue uh, is much more complicated and women do not find a safe space to discuss the challenges and problems and issues that face women um, inside the political and public spheres. The, the caucus is, um, is a, a public organization, it's an official organization that there's on a yearly basis and 
discusses uh, main issues helping women to, uh, to do different sorts of things such as uh, following elections uh, such as parliamentary or presidential elections in the different Arab uh, countries, working together to exchange knowledge and uh, ex uh, experiences around drafting constitutions or um, the, the mere presence of women in politics. Um, the caucus producers produces a yearly report that, um, that studies one of the main issues um, that are pertinent to uh, women in politics in the region. The report is usually disseminated through a con 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 press, press conference, and uh, the caucus uh, always welcomes new members, produces a statement about the, issue, the current situation in the region in different ways. For those who are interested, we are going to uh, we are going to write in the chat section the website of the caucus and on the website you can find uh, more information about the members of the caucus as well as about the reports and the data uh, of the caucus and and some of them some of the reports are in english and others are in arabic our region has been going through um, a lot of issues that are exacerbating more and more. As women in the caucus, we see that our presence is crucial. Uh, it's very crucial for us to remain in solidarity, in real solidarity, and not just um, not just by words, but in action to participate together um, to overcome challenges and to deal with common issues that affect us all. We try to focus on most of the issues that affect us, but we cannot deal with all the issues because, because of the, the speed of the ongoing issues and also because we're not numerous, in addition to the pressures exerted on civil society organizations and feminist organizations in Egypt that are not allowing us to be present always. Um, but um, Yemen is always in our and I'm not just saying this in the face of and in the presence of the Yemeni women who are attending today, but because for real, all the Yemeni women are continuously um, struggling and uh, working hard and they're doing great efforts to overcome challenges, which is uh, amazing. And, 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 and Yemen is a country with a long history of struggles and um, with a feminist history of women who are who are fighting against against patriarchy and all the challenges that face women in the Yemeni society. So today we wanted to start with the, the, the series of our webinars uh, with the case of Yemen. Um, so today we're starting with Yemen, hoping to pay them back all the efforts that they're doing and all the challenges that they are facing. Today, we will be listening to women from Yemen, women who have long experience and in different fields and who have different backgrounds. They present some of the voices in Yemen. We will uh, listen to them, we will learn from them. And, and personally, I always learn from women and feminists and in the world and also in this region but from Yemeni women in particular I learned a lot I learned a lot always and it is our honor to have Yemeni women with us um, always fighting all the pressures exerted from outside and inside Yemen so this this webinar will be moderated by the by my my icon the great uh, from Tunisia, but she hasn't joined us yet, and I don't want to um, interrupt the webinar. But oh, here she is, she just joined us. So, Bushra just joined us, she's connecting. Here she is. Hello, Bushra. 
So Busha just joined us and she will be uh, moderating the webinar. The last thing I want to say is that uh, we are uh, checking the chat section. Um, so for those of you who would like to write a question or discuss any idea, so please feel free to drop a message, drop your questions in the, uh, in the chat section. Um, I hope you can all uh, mute yourselves and uh, only unmute yourselves whenever you are speaking so that the internet works well for all of us so that we can listen to, our, to each other better. Um, and and uh, whenever you're speaking, please um, open the, the, the camera so that we can hear you. Now I'm going to leave the floor to uh, Bushra. She hasn't heard me when I said she is my icon, but I'm going to repeat this. She's my icon. I, we all learn a lot from Bushra. She's a feminist Tunisian, and um, she's a previous member of parliament in, in Tunisia. Um, she, had, she has a long history in fighting for feminist uh, rights and women's rights. She is... Um, she, she, she is... Uh, she has been heavily involved in promulgating the, um, the, the law on women in Tunisia. And she's pushed up and has, so no one's like her. Uh, first of all, I apologize for being late. Uh, hello, dear friends. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet uh, under these exceptional conditions, but it's always a great opportunity to meet uh, you all. Um, I'm going to be brief and uh, it's great to be speaking to all of you, my friends, today. هناك بعض الأصدقاء في تونس لما شافوا الإعلان عن هذا الاجتماع سألوني لماذا اليمن فقلت لأن اليمن نعلم جميع أنها تعيش وضع استثنائي نعلم جميع أن النساء والرجال في اليمن والشباب والأطفال يعيشون نار الحرب الحرب يعني من الأخوة من المفروض ما كانش أصلا تصير لو لمصالح معينة so, and this uh, is all based on uh, political interests uh, and driven by political interests. It's really important uh, uh, as part of the feminist solidarity to hold such uh, meetings and webinars. And I really thank the group who decided to organize this webinar and decided that we need to gather and discuss the situation of the women in Yemen. Uh, it's related in the relation uh, between COVID-19 and the war in Yemen and ceasefire and how it's going, how women are living and urban living under these conditions in Yemen, how the Yemeni authorities should deal with COVID-19 in Yemen, what is the role of women, what do they have to do with the women, what are the initiatives that the feminists and women in Yemen have to deal with the challenges there are facing? Uh, طبعا بنظرا للوضع اسمحوا لي بكلمة كيف في اليمن ربما مجابهة المشاكل الاجتماعية والإنسانية ربما تطلبت أكثر مجهود وأكثر عمل وأكثر ربما تضحية من النساء والمقيدات النسائية والحركات النسائية كيف يعني تتعاملت أيضا أمام مرفض عديد أطراف وقف الحرب وقف معناها هو لو يعني مطلب كان على أساس النقاط مؤقتا يعني مع هذا رأينا كيف ما لم يكن سهلا so يعني we, we هل كانت فرصة لتقدم في مفاوضات السلسلة السلام هذه الفترة هل يعني هناك um, تراجع من بعض الأطراف how, يعني ما يحصل في اليمن يعني هناك أيضا أسئلة من كيف ما هي سبل المساندة والدعم اللي تعمل النساء اليمنات من أجل الحصول إليها وعليها في ظل استمرار الحرب وخطر الكوفيد 19 بعض تحصل لكن ما زال خطر اليوم تدخلات وقراءات من أصحاب المعلومة والأطباء أنه ما زال خطر هنا 
هل كيف تتعامل كذلك مع قرارات الامم المتحده ومجلس الامن؟ How did the UN Council deal with the situation in the world? Today, we will try together to discuss and respond to the situation in the world. We will try together to discuss and respond to the situation in the world. أعطي الكلمة الدكتورة بلقيس أبو أسباع عضوة المجموعة الاستشارية النسائية لمكتب مقاومة ممين لدولة يمن لتقدم نفسك يعني في دولة كلمات رغم أنواع المسير تتطلب ربما أكثر وقت لكن خلينا نستفيد ونعرف لكن ربما بعض الناس يعني خليك تقدم مين لنفسك أكثر وأعطيك الكلمة المباشرة مساء الخير جميعا. Hello everyone. Good evening. جزيلا بشرة. Thank you so much. بشرة. ملتقى النساء في السياسة. Thank you to the caucus for women politicians in the Arab region. Thank you, Muzan, for inviting us to this webinar. I think this really important webinar that discusses the most important issues that the people in Yemen and the women in Yemen are dealing with. الدكتورة بلقيس أبو أصبا أنا أستاذة كلمة سياسية أنا دكتورة بلقيس أبو أصبا أنا رئيسة لمؤسسة أوام التنموية الثقافية التي تهتم بالمشاركة السياسية للنساء في اليمن 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 for the um, necessary participation of women in politics. Now, since uh, in, in the post-war phase, we've been working on peace building with women in Yemen and trying to bring peace to Yemen and hopefully we'll, we'll succeed in that. First of all, please allow me to, to express my gratitude uh, to be here with you today, um, as well as um, my gratitude to, to be with all the panelists and all those who are listening to us. And as I said, this is one of the most important topics in, in, in the Yemeni scene today, be it the war or the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'll be speaking about this issue uh, really quick and briefly. And for main points, first of all, I'll talk about the social and economic situation in Yemen and the impact of the war on peace issues on Yemen, women in Yemen in particular, and at the end, how can the rights for women in the Arab region support Yemeni women, and how can we all bring peace to Yemen? The first point that I'm going to talk about is that Yemen is living in harsh wars. These two harsh wars are killing people out of stock. The first is the military war in Yemen and the second is COVID-19. I want to talk about the military war in Yemen. This is the sixth year of the war in Yemen. So this war has brought the worst humanitarian crisis in Yemen in its history. And even the worst humanitarian crisis in the entire world. It has led to hundreds of thousands of deaths of human civilians. It has led to a very, very dire humanitarian situation where 80% of people are in urgent need for humanitarian assistance. This war has led to 20 million people living um, in, in lack of food security and need an urgent assistance. There are 4 million displaced Yemenis and this displacement is not fixed. It is changing from a region to another because of the extension of the between regions. And today, the main problem is how to stop this. Each time, um, each time there's a war. There's a conflict in a certain region, we find more displacement. 
وأدى هذا التقلص so إلى تقليص فرص العمل بشكل كبير جدا وأدى إلى مزيد من الفقر ومزيد um, من المجاعة ومزيد من كل الإشكاليات التي تعاني منها الدول أثناء الحروب وبالتالي كيف يمكن هذه الحرب أن تتوقف؟ so هذه الحرب كما قلت هي أثرت بشكل كبير جدا على المجتمع اليمني بكل ألوانه وأطيافه في مجال الصحة والاقتصاد والتعليم إلى آخره لكنها أثرت أيضا على النساء بشكل كبير جدا هذه الحرب عملت على اتساع معدلات العنف ضد النساء أو العنف القائم على النوع الاجتماعي في ظل عدم وجود آليات حماية بسبب الحرب حيث بلغت هذه النسبة 63 في المئة أيضا أدت هذه الحرب إلى نزوح العديد من النساء أدى ذلك إلى الحد من حركة الفتيات والنساء وانعكس ذلك على قدرتهم للوصول إلى فرص كسب العيش والعمل في المجتمع اليمني أيضا أدت هذه الحرب إلى ارتفاع معدلات We cannot hear you, Hello? Dr. Alkis. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear her. Uh, As I said, Yemeni women have led to the possibility of their mobility and their access to livelihood, to employment opportunities, and further poverty among women-led households and families. The war has led to the death of a lot of Yemeni women, and so a lot of women-led households have lost their main breadwinners and women breadwinners in the family. أيضا أدى النزاع إلى ظهور ظواهر اجتماعية لم تكن معتادة في المجتمع اليمني مثل التسول والدعارة وأدى إلى ارتفاع زواج القاصرات وأدى إلى مزيد من العنف الجنسي وأدى إلى أشياء كثيرة جدا لم تكن هذه الأشياء متواجدة أو خلف الظواهر متواجدة في المجتمع اليمني ولكن في هذا المجتمع ظلت النساء اليمنيات في المجتمع منذ بداية الحرب حتى الآن منذ ما قبل الحرب تبذل النساء اليمنيات الكثير من الجهد لمعالجة كل هذه الظواهر والمعالجة كل هذه الأسباب to deal with all these situations. Yemeni women have participated in contributing to humanitarian assistance. They also led to assistance. They are among the first to contribute to such efforts and to executing such efforts. Also, women have because they lost the main breadwinner, they have entered into a new role. 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 ليس also, فقط النساء ولكن المجتمع اليمني بشكل عام منذ بداية الحرب حتى الآن لم يعني لم يتلقوا أي مرتبات يعني نظامية هذه المرتبات أدت إلى أن كثير من النساء التي كنا يعيشن على هذه المرتبات أيضا امتهن مهن أخرى لكي يستطيعن أن يكون عائلات وصلهن كالخياطة كفتح الكوافير كعمل يعني مشاري في دخل المنازل مثل عمل الأكل يعني والبيع وكل هذا أدى إلى تدني أيضاً والدخل الذي كانت تحصل على النساء اليمنيات لكن النساء اليمنيات حتى في ظل الحرب even amid war, we're capable of opening up doors on the level of society as well as enhancing the prospects for their participation and social participation. The second point I'm going to talk about is how to challenge COVID-19. How did women in Yemen challenge COVID-19? 
and as well as the Yemeni society, how uh, did it deal with COVID-19? On the 11th of March 2020, um, COVID-19 has been announced as a, a, a global pandemic. And so we were dealing with this war that major uh, states around the world weren't able to deal with. And today, uh, the, 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 the size of the disaster in, in Yemen is huge. Uh, until today, there are no studies or no data, um, no, no accurate monitoring for the repercussions of COVID-19 in Yemen. Um, I think there are some studies uh, going on these days and some monitoring uh, for uh, the violence that women are subject to and it's COVID-19. In Yemen, um, the first case uh, inf uh, affected by COVID-19 um, was announced uh, early April, so one month after announcing this global pandemic. And so, after that, that month, COVID-19 expanded in Yemen really quickly and in the lives of thousands of Yemenis all around Yemen. However, because uh, of the يعني lack of monitoring uh, of the number of deaths uh, of COVID-19 infected people, we do not really know the size of the expansion of this pandemic, uh, especially in the north. But in other regions, there, are, there is some monitoring and announcement about the number of cases, but I think uh, what, is, what is being announced is less than what is in reality. Uh, I think the number of cases has been increasing really quick. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, there were there was not enough space to bury the bodies of those who were dead with COVID-19. And I think most of the Yemenis were, were dying in their houses, uh, and we did not know the reason for their death uh, due to the lack of uh, uh, tests and, and, and lab tests. But I think now uh, there, uh, there is some more monitoring uh, around the COVID-19 situation in Yemen. Now, because of the war, the military war, the uh, healthcare uh, service, healthcare sector in Yemen has deteriorated. It's now working with its, uh, half of its capacity. So, and the, the percentage of medical doctors is really low. Uh, there were no uh, medical equipment to, uh, to, to check and test COVID-19. There are no uh, quarantine centers. Uh, uh, rooms to, to deal with COVID-19 patients, uh, and I think this is leading and has led to a bigger crisis to exacerbating the, the impact of COVID-19 in Yemen. COVID-19 in Yemen has not only impacted women, but also the entire Yemeni society. But I think uh, women uh, in particular are uh, the category that deals with the with a bigger burden uh, and crisis, and, and women have dealt with this crisis as a double burden. Many women are now facing threats, dangerous threats related to their reproductive health. Only 20% of women. Knowing that all the there's a low there were two women, they, they are really, they were really young and um, there was no one accepting COVID-19 for them. So, so hospitals are decreasing the 
We tried our best to uh, uh, connect with people, يعني people and networking and talking to people to allow them to enter. So the people in Taiz have done a lot of effort to save the lives of those two women. This is just one example of what would happen in displacement camps in Yemen. Camps and this displacement, as I said, is changing. Now, the second point is gender based violence. As I said, because of the war, uh, violence has increased on women. Because of COVID-19, now with COVID-19, this violence has also increased, and, and we all have been dealing with it all over the world, but also because of living in really crowded areas, and, and camps, and camps, um, which has led to increased levels of gender. Also, women in these camps, in, in the Yemeni society as a whole, were not able to access social support services after being infected with COVID-19 or um, even accessing legal assistance or protection. Um, so, so we're, we're in a war, uh, living a war and a lot of problems. The third point is their inability to, uh, to access the social support, as I said, but also now I'm going to talk about uh, how COVID-19, um, so, so women have tried to uh, put a lot of effort to uh, deal with their families, families, to head their households and their families to be the main breadwinners for their families, but then COVID-19 came, and, uh, because of the inability to leave their houses, وأيضاً كان هناك أيضاً بعض الأشياء الذي أثرت على المسائل عندما بدأت كوفيد 19 تم كل محلات الكوافير التي تديرها النساء لكن لم تغلق المحلات والصوالين الرجالية وبالتالي يعني كان هذا أيضاً يعني يعني جزء من الضغط على النساء في مواجهة كوفيد 19 في ظل غياب يعني رب الأسرة أو المعين داخل أيضاً صعوبة الوصول إلى المعلومات والتكنولوجيا والتعليم البعد في اليمن هناك صعوبة أولاً لا يوجد كهرباء طول الوقت وإذا وجدت الكهرباء فهي توجد لوقت وأيضاً uh, most of the time, uh, and if there is electricity, it's only in some regions, and also because of the rate of illiteracy and the camps of displacement, people do not find the main needs, basic needs, and drink. So they, they do not have access to the information and to the internet, so most of the women in Yemen cannot be with us because of the lack of internet and connection and electricity. So this has led to, uh, to further uh, spreading the virus because awareness raising did uh, not reach those women. Uh, but even amid COVID-19, all Yemeni women, Yemeni women were in the first uh, we were the first who were facing all the problems. They were main, str mainly very strong, facing everything in the first place. Um, amid COVID-19, women, uh, nurses, uh, field workers, uh, medical doctors, um, who have been dealing with COVID-19 and fighting against it. Now, a lot of them, medical doctors in Yemen, women medical doctors, have lost their lives due to COVID-19 because they're in the the first, um, uh, like in the first place where they're fighting against COVID-19, so we lost a lot of um, medical uh, staff, women medical staff in Yemen, and they're fighting against COVID-19. But this hasn't really um, avoided it in, in the fight. So even Yemeni women have uh, worked on supply and, 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 and
في التوعية في النزول إلى الأرياء في نزول أماكن تجمع النساء في النزول إلى المخيمات في محاولة حياة حياة من أجل أن يسهلنا عمل للنساء اليمنيات مثلا في مناطق هنا تبعد حول المياه يجعل الأماكن بعيدة من أجل لبنى المياه أو من أجل يحصلنا على خدمة بسيطة ساعدت النساء أثناء جائحة كوفيد 19 كيف ممكن حل مثل هذه المساعدات وعمل يعني مشاريع صغيرة للنساء إلى آخره حتى ولو كان حتى لو ولو كنا من البيت يعني ظلت المرأة اليمنية so Remain active and ready and present. Remain the main fighter. The third point is how the relationship between COVID-19 and peace building in Yemen. What happened in this issue to date and what have Yemeni women done? Yeah. So first of all, we, like, we were all optimistic that uh, with the spread of COVID-19, ceasefire will happen in Yemen or war will stop. We thought that the size of, the, of this pandemic and like, the impact of this pandemic will, will lead to Dr. Antilok and can add to this uh, later. I think uh, we can say that uh, women have played an important role in peace building in Yemen, not only uh, as of now, but uh, since 2011 to date. Uh, in 2011, we saw Yemeni women uh, in the streets, uh, in, in, in close societies in Yemen that do not allow them to women. But we saw إذا صح لنا التعبير بهذا الشكل. أيضا في في أثناء مؤتمر الحوار الوطني في 2013 أيضا كان لهن دور. دكتور بالكيس، please if you can be brief so that so that we can listen to the other panelists. And the National Dialogue Women had a really special and important role. Women participated in a series of negotiations. Yemeni women have established coalitions, feminist coalitions and women coalitions. So many. Including the Yemeni Women Advisory Group for the UN Special Envoy in Yemen, and they all participated in the peace building efforts. Uh, they were also able to, to present the situation of Yemen to the UN Special Envoy in Yemen. What I want to say is that Yemeni women are present. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Belchis. Uh, uh, so, thank you, Dr. Belchis. شكراً جزيلاً. شكراً لك. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really important what you mentioned and how you describe the situation, the the socio-economic situation and the national situation in Yemen, even before COVID-19. So maybe COVID-19 was a was a really disastrous opportunity that has uh, showed the um, repercussions of war uh, and displacement and uh, what the, the displaced Yemeni are going through from real uh, problems on a daily basis and the role of Yemeni women in all this. Uh, 
before uh, moving, uh, please, dear panelists, uh, please choose the German German for the um, for the Arabic uh, translation. To, to listen to the uh, webinar in Arabic, please click on German. And if you want to listen to the English interpretation, please uh, click on G English. So uh, the English channel is for English and German is for Arabic. Um, now we're going to be listening to Dr. Hana Mukbel after our friend Balqis has talked about uh, the, the, the social situation in Yemen. Uh, you will be now talking more about the role of um, uh, like the security issues in Yemen and how, um, how uh, the Yemeni uh, state has dealt with with a with a situation and with a uh, with the invite of the, the UN Security Council to us uh, to stop uh, the war and for ceasefire in Yemen. And later, uh, Antilak will be talking more about the role of uh, women in Yemen. So now we'll be talking more about the decisions uh, of the, the UN Security Council. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Ushka. Um, uh, uh, my name is Hana Abdel Fattah Mokbel, uh, member of Yemeni Women Pact Peace and Security and member of the Caucus for Women Politicians in the Arab region. I'll be talking about the role that Yemeni women have played in the war and even amid COVID-19. Uh, Yemeni women have uh, dealt with the efforts of the war and also of COVID-19. And, uh, and so the, they took the roles of women, of men. Uh, so, so how the, the war has affected women, women who are the, the category that is uh, mostly affected by war, and, and how women are being pressured by the political uh, parties in, in Yemen, and the absence of, um, of uh, the, the absence of engaging women in politics in Yemen and uh, how the state in Yemen considers that women's participation is not a priority. However, Yemeni women are continuing to be present um, and uh, are, are, uh, they have ongoing efforts in, in delivering the, the voices of uh, Yemeni women and, and um, fulfilling uh, active political roles for women. On the level of relief, women have a really important providing um, relief uh, assistance and humanitarian assistance for women, uh, displaced women in all different uh, provinces in Yemen, be it under uh, the war in Yemen or even during uh, amid COVID-19 lately. Women had a really important role through, through all the different civil society organizations in Yemen. Uh, we played a huge role um, amid this situation, feminist women in Yemen uh, have participated uh, uh, in negotiation tables uh, in an official capacity with the with participating delegations, even if the uh, participation of women was uh, somehow low, but they participated in anyhow, and they were present. And the uh, un and informal discussions and Women also participated through uh, delegations being sent uh, during during um, the negotiation tables and the uh, discussions that were taking place, uh, whether in Kuwait um, or so in, in, in all those negotiations, women in Yemen. In, in an informal capacity were present in the negotiations. Um, different uh, feminist uh, coalitions and entities were established in initiatives, feminist initiatives, the most important of which uh, um, is the one calling for, the first one that was calling for 
the peace uh, building um, and, and a lot of other initiatives were uh, established during the war. So a lot of uh, organizations have worked in the war. A lot of feminist organizations in Yemen stood for the, for the empowerment of women on the political level in Yemen. Women on the political level have, uh, have succeeded uh, in being actively involved and participating. Women feminist coalition in Yemen who, uh, gathered women from the different uh, parties in, in Yemen under a feminist uh, organization uh, and on a voluntary basis for peace building. I will also now talk about the security level. On the security level, there were uh, important efforts for, for women, uh, such as uh, mediation and initiatives regarding the, uh, the, the kidnapped and uh, the detainees in Yemen. Uh, women were not uh, engaged in, um, in, the, in the reconciliation uh, committees, but women, women have had in personal and individual efforts, collective women efforts, to uh, to mediate in the in the in the in the issue of the detainees and the opening of uh, the borders. Women have also worked on the legal uh, level to monitor the breaches of human rights uh, by the warring parties. Uh, also on the level of protection, women have worked on uh, the issues of uh, victims of violence, women of violence, and also uh, the, in collaboration with other feminist and women organizations, um, women have worked in, in, in empowering each other on, uh, politically through uh, feminist organizations. Amid uh, COVID-19, women had an important role in, as Dr. Balkis said, in, in fighting uh, the, the pandemic during uh, the uh, advocacy plans for the uh, feminist consensus. So they were on the front lines to, uh, after the UN Security uh, Council has, uh, has invited Yemen for a ceasefire. The, the, the feminist coalition that was formed in 2015, gathering different uh, feminist groups from different provinces uh, whose objectives is to lead the voices of women in Yemen and to stop the war. So, and, and also worked on an advocacy plan for two months. We cooperated with the group nine um, in sponsorship of the United Nations. In 2015, this coalition, this feminist coalition was established. And, and then the, the feminist uh, group was formed in 2019. It, it was working on different uh, youth initiatives for peace building and for ceasefire and to stop the war and to support the stop of the war. All these groups have worked lately on an advocacy strategy that includes different activities that support uh, stopping the war through campaigns. Such campaigns included different provinces in Yemen, like Sana'a, Hadramut, Adan, Ta'az. 
in addition to other provinces in Yemen through, uh, and that has been done, this campaign has been done through social media. This campaign was about uh, messages to stop the war and to support uh, the call of the UN Security Council to, to cease fire and also to fight COVID-19. The campaign also included um, a number of videos and infographs that told uh, peace messages and, and messages to fight COVID-19. Also, uh, there, there were, there's this, um, so some of the policy paper were also uh, written and drafted to, to support the call for ceasefire and also to, to see how women are doing in such initiatives and to produce a common vision, common feminist vision for the political process uh, from a consensual point of view. Uh, other outputs uh, of this campaign that has uh, had lots of uh, important impact also included interviews with the uh, working parties. Uh, so we had uh, meetings, direct meetings with the working parties and meetings and online meetings with the active uh, participants and, and active uh, actors in the peace building process and also with the UN Security Council and also with the British ambassador and the German ambassador and the Deutsche ambassador and the ambassador of the EU in addition to the foreign minister of Sweden. We had meetings also in Sanaa and in Adan with, with many working parties to support the ceasefire. And all these meetings aimed at stopping the war, but also, but also the delivering and enhancing the uh, women participation in the future. The campaign also resulted in in, in meeting with local parties, not only on the international level, but also, uh, also on the local level with the, the, with the local mediators, uh, as mediators in dealing with the detainees issues, also in, in, in initiatives for opening the borders. Also, um, we met with some of the ministries and some of the uh, province, uh, head of provinces, and those who have a hand in, in stopping the war. All of these outputs of this campaign are stopping the war and unifying the efforts to fight COVID-19. Women, women uh, from all fields, worked on raising awareness in the fight of COVID-19 through sharing uh, posters and posts and participating in, in, in uh, the media and uh, delivering uh, messages for the youth and, you, and by the youth and holding a lot of activities during the last couple of months to support the stop of the war and to fight COVID-19. Women, although they were suffering from all the burdens, but they were in the front lines in the fight, and they had a remarkable role in fighting the war and fighting COVID-19, such as the medical doctors, women from medical doctors in Yemen who, who did not stay at home and uh, put their lives under threat in the hospitals and had a really huge role uh, during this pandemic. And many uh, medical doctors from women and nurses 
uh, have lost their lives amid this pandemic. And a lot of initiatives from civil society in Yemen worked on uh, spreading precautions against COVID-19 uh, in addition to uh, producing uh, masks, face masks, and uh, sterilizers and uh, hygiene products, uh, distributing them and distributing awareness, raising posters and messages, uh, especially for those who don't use social media. So we raised awareness in, in, in different ways possible. The campaign reached different levels, be it on the political level of, uh, like the first political level of ambassadors and key uh, political actors in Yemen, um, in addition to the level of civil society organizations and NGOs through networking, uh, with them around stopping the war and fighting COVID-19, in addition to uh, to uh, the the grassroots level, uh, in addition to campaigning with the grassroots level that would use the social media through sharing through sharing posters and messages with them, also through sending them uh, messages SMS on their mobile phones on their mobile phones and also on social media. And all this uh, was to stop the war and fight COVID-19. I think that's it. Oh. So also other out of this campaign that supported the stop of the war and and really succeeded and and, and uh, really positive um, got really positive feedbacks through messages and uh, that we got and through also feedback from meetings so we received a lot of feedback for what women have done in Yemen amid COVID-19 and to stop the war. A lot of panel discussions were held in addition to many, um, to, to many articles being written or published. So uh, this, this, this uh, campaign reached a wide audience and hopefully women in Yemen will, will continue to campaign and to work hard to reach peace in Yemen. So Bushra, can you unmute yourself please? So, so now uh, we'll be listening to uh, Bushra, formal uh, no. no, so uh, we just heard uh, about the resolutions of the UN Security Council in Yemen around women. Some of the questions that uh, our friends present with us here have uh, have for us are first of all um, like talking about how uh, the different foreign parties have responded to the UN Security Council's call for ceasefire and the second point uh, is uh, the second point that a lot of us are asking about is whether there's a report uh, that has been produced by feminist movements in in Yemen around the impact of this uh, pandemic on women and, uh, and also uh, in relation to violence against women. So, and this is not unique to Yemen, but this is prevalent in all countries. Uh, the number of uh, women who are subject to violence is increasing um, amid COVID-19 and uh, amid the quarantine in most countries. 
this, uh, these numbers are growing, levels of uh, violence against women and, and households amid COVID-19 is, is, is really growing. Is there any report about this? And, uh, and if so, can we get some outputs about it? Thank you, doctor. Please go ahead. So, Dr. Tilak, um, would you like me to answer now or the questions are for the, the, the previous panelists? So, as you see, uh, you can actually answer those in your intervention um, or directly just now, whatever you like. So, first of all, hello everyone. Thank you for the caucus for women politicians in the Arab region to host me and to host uh, my colleagues and for the interest of the caucus in, um, in exposing the, the issue of Yemen and of the Yemeni. As you know, historically, the happy Yemen that is now today uh, witnessing the biggest humanitarian disaster. Um, and which is built by the human, and it's not a natural catastrophe, it's a human-built catastrophe. COVID-19, regarding COVID-19, so the war first came to uh, shift this happy Yemen to a disastrous Yemen, and then COVID-19 came, and some, uh, some researchers uh, expected that Yemen will disappear from the map, from the world map, but uh, as the Yemenis, we say that Yemen is like um, uh, is, is like a bird uh, that the Yemen two years, but then return. And this is how we see Yemen, and this is what we believe about the Yemen. Just what happened in in Al Ma'rib uh, that uh, like was broke, and then uh, it it was fine again. So. We will have the Yemen that we love. Back. So I'm going to answer now two questions that uh, Bushra has uh, asked. Did the feminist move, uh, feminist groups write a report about gender-based violence against women in Yemen? So um, with the UNFPA, there's there's one report being uh, prepared right now, and there are different meetings being held on Zoom. Uh, with a cluster responsible for violence and protection. Is there probably uh, a response to uh, women's interventions and initiatives? Uh, I would say yes, based on the last campaign. Uh, there, was a, there was a really uh, evident response. Just uh, like what Dr. Valkis mentioned, seven women went to Kuwait to support the negotiations. But the warring parties disagreed on that day to meet with the Yemeni women. And we say uh, that uh, with the pressure of the special UN envoy on that day, the warring parties uh, of Yemen agreed to meet with the uh, well, Yemeni women and to talk to us. No one ever um, really um, acknowledged the, the feminist coalition, but then now with the nine uh, groups that present the different provinces in Yemen, uh, our co feminist coalition were capable of meeting uh, the prime minister uh, and, the, and the Yemeni government. In addition to meeting with the, uh, with the, with the government, uh, informal government of Yemen, um, and also with other decision makers who wanted to meet with us and talk to us. So I would say that there is a change uh, in, in dealing and accepting uh, women. It could be uh, uh, like a perception uh, like they might be acknowledging the importance of having women participating in the peace building process. The special UN envoy said that uh, this, this group of feminist women entities, 
that gathers feminist organizations from different political backgrounds. We were capable to we were capable of working together regardless of our political uh, differences and disparities. Uh, and we remained neutral politically. So the special UN envoy uh, told one of the opposition uh, leaders that there might be a relative consensus among us. So I think the, there's a change and the and the and, and how the decision makers are looking at the war um, and fighting COVID nineteen. Now, uh, what the 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 issue that I'm be, I'm going to be talking about is the international ratifications and decisions around uh, and pacts around Yemen and the recommendations by Yemeni women. I'm going to briefly discuss them so that everyone else can have the chance to discuss them as well. So the demands of women resulted from concentrations to enhance the role of women in peace building under the resolution number 1523 based on the support of GIZ and also the consent among the nine groups and the advocacy for a ceasefire and for um, unifying the efforts to stop the war in Yemen. It was also a call from the UN Special Envoy to Yemen and also the UN Security Council. The latest report, official report by the CEDAW was in 26 and 2012. Also, um, also another one in 2012 after the Arab Spring. So during the Arab Spring, the revolution in Yemen was both armed and civilian. Nowadays, um, the civil society actors with women leaders have um, have made some uh, shadow reports for CEDAW, uh, such as the National Committee uh, in collaboration with the Human Rights Committee. So the C the the CEDAW committee uh, had some recommendations. Now regarding the decision, there was an important point about engaging women in leadership roles or um, not the stereotype roles that we know. So that we want women to be part of the peace building and stopping the war, to be active uh, actors and not just reci recipients. And this was at the beginning of the conflict when we knew, uh, based on the participation of uh, active women in the Arab Spring, as Dr. Barkis has mentioned. So women with their participation in the streets, be it in the streets supporting the authorities or the opposition at the time, uh, women have uh, have contributed to changing, uh, shifting the role of women because society wouldn't agree that women would be in the streets protesting. But we have seen women uh, with their husbands, with their uh, kids uh, protesting, sleeping in the uh, tents where they are protesting in the, uh, in the squares of the protest. And even the media, in the media, most of those who were appearing in the media were women. So this stereotype uh, has been broken. The traditional uh, perception that women should be conserving their traditions has been broken. We found that political will is behind 
women empowerment. So if the political uh, decision makers wanted to empower women, they can. So when the political um, leaders wanted the, the wanted women to engage in the dialogue, they engaged them. So they engaged them in the uh, national dialogue, also in the committee for drafting the constitution. Um, four women participated in drafting the constitution uh, uh, as part of 19 other members. So four out of 19 were women. The outputs of the dialogue were around 186 as part of the 1325 decision resolution. Uh, we had recommendations around the protection, the participation of women. And nowadays we have a national plan that has been announced by the Minister of Social Affairs, Ibtihaj, who is also a woman, uh, that the uh, Ministry of Social Affairs, with the help of the UNESCO, and also in the la last meeting uh, where the uh, women uh, or some women in Yemen with, with the Ministry of Human Rights. Uh, they announced that they are willing to establish a national plan to deal and to cooperate with the uh, government. So also we had some recommendations around, uh, like those who were issued in 2011, around the protection and the participation of women, uh, a complete participation of women equally uh, in decision-making. Resolution number 2140, February 2014, welcomed uh, the, uh, the, the participation of women, uh, no less than 30%. And as Yemeni, we insist that 30% that no less than 30%, quote unquote, should be 50%, but this is just the first step. The resolution number 2216, uh, uh, April 2015, there was a mention of women slightly mentioned in the uh, demands of the Yemeni people. They said the demands of the Yemeni people, including women and the youth. Now, a most recent wars in 2020, one of the resolutions in 2020 uh, encourages the importance of the Yemen to abide by the international humanitarian law and the international law. And uh, the importance of the warring parties to commit to, uh, to the international humanitarian law, and the human rights law. And I, when I say warring parties, I don't mean only the, the, the Yemeni warring parties, but also the other uh, neighboring parties that are involved, such as the Emirates and, the, and Saudi Arabia who are involved in the war in Yemen. And also, we had uh, an expert report uh, on Yemen in 2019 and in 2018, mentioning the, a number of cases uh, uh, of um, gender-based violence. The report in 2018 and in 2019 mentioned that in some cases, the warring parties are using as a tactic to pressure the, the other parties uh, to use gender-based violence. And this was really scary and breached what we got used to uh, from the Yemeni value, values. Now, the important thing is that the um, provisions related to uh, women's rights are not given are not given a priority in terms of uh, um, uh, implementation. We find that uh, the UN Special Envoy usually demands uh, disarmament, and the warring parties usually. Uh, the warring parties usually demand. The warring parties usually demand uh, demand uh, have certain demands in issues that 
that are related to policies and decision making, but do not really have demands related to the status of women. Now, of course, this is uh, this is uh, requiring international resolutions that need to be implemented and respected. The provisions related to women protection and support need to be respected by the UN Special Envoys, Envoy as well as the different uh, international actors. The international community need to focus on uh, women protection and support. We also rely on the UN to support the participation and empowerment of women in addition to pressuring uh, for, uh, for the importance of women's political participation in Yemen. The provisions related to uh, women need to be dealt with really carefully. We look at our participation as women uh, as an obligation we and the commitment we would never reach a, a safe and dignified yemen without uh, the participation of a minimum of 50 percent of women in yemen in the political process and we wouldn't reach a democracy otherwise and we wouldn't really reach the demands of most of the people if women do not uh, take part in decision making in yemen now, in relation to uh, the recommendations and demands of Yemeni women, and these are not my personal demands, but so the first demand that uh, women have agreed on from the beginning of the war until this day is to stop the war. We have supported the uh, call of the UN Special Envoy and the UN Security Council to stop and and for ceasefire so we wanted to start with a peace build, building process and not just like a temporary ceasefire but rather like a peace building process long-term one now on the political level and in, when it comes to political participation there are so many feminist demands that uh, we hope that those of you who who, uh, who look for 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 its support because it will be helping the Yemen uh, to advancing the Yemen. The first the first provision is about uh, ensuring the safety of women. We have seen in the international sphere um, in the meetings with the international actors that that the decision makers in Yemen think that it's not the time for uh, Yemeni women today. It's not the time for women. They think that the, the priority is not for the participation of women. Of course, this is just like, um, uh, just like, an, like an advertisement done by uh, decision makers because they are afraid of losing their positions against women. And and also another point is about uh, ensuring the adequate funding for uh, women-led initiatives and for women empowerment and for the programming of uh, women-led initiatives. We have uh, we have noticed lately that programs uh, where women participate in peace building are shrinking support is now being directed towards logistical uh, support for armed support and for other things uh, but not for the participation of women also the participation of uh, women and all the different committees taking part in decision making in yemen have uh, witnessed uh, women participation. Yeah, uh, women in Yemen don't only want to attend the negotiations, they want to be at the heart of uh, drafting uh, uh, what is related to peace building and, and like to have a real participation in peace building. We are really proud uh, to be part of the women in the consultations with the UN envoy um, for Yemen. But we have participated 
uh, in a capacity of 30 percent with the national in the national dialogue and in the drafting of the constitution so now we see that there is a decline in the in choosing um now uh like a like a council for without having direct direct engagement of women and we see that it's a shame uh, that they're not putting women at the heart of the agenda and at the heart of the participation of peace building for example in the consultations done by the un special envoy on uh, the financing and economics no single woman was engaged or participated as if women are not uh, 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 like they're not meant to be in in that field or if they're not uh, really experienced in that field and even if they consider that they're not women are not experienced uh, who said that all the men who are there are experienced the uh, the, the participation of men in decision making uh, is not enough and there's a need for the participation of women decision making and the UN special envoy for Yemen needs to uh, implement uh, resolution number 1325 and the UN special envoy whom we really uh, respect I respect personally a lot I respect him a lot but he, he says that I'm a mediator who cannot really pressure for the participation of women. Well, no, he can actually pressure for the participation of women. He is uh, required to actually implement such a resolution. Now, the participation of women in all the different committees that fight uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and in drawing uh, policies related to the status of women um, there are some uh, in Taz, for example, there are some border lines, uh, border uh, uh, checkpoints. Uh, now people would take like 12 hours to, uh, to move from a, uh, from a border line to another. So it's taking much more now. And uh, women need to be engaging with the neighboring countries. Uh, to deal with the uh, with the uh, with a war in Yemen, women are capable and qualified, able enough to 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 be the the main peace builders. Why don't they Why don't they rely on on women in peace building? So and and when it comes to the healthcare service, all uh, the policies. Uh, in the fight of COVID-19 need to be sensitive to uh, gender and the different uh, gender needs. Um, for example, in quarantine, we noticed that there was no separation um, between men and women in the houses. Uh, and, and there was no risk respect for women's needs in terms of uh, bathrooms, cleaning, uh, cleaned places, cleaned rooms. So we need to take the direct and indirect effect of such uh, uh, measures on women and we need to, like the adequate policies to deal with them. Now how to deal with the reproductive health. Um, now lately COVID-19, the situation of COVID-19 has been um, Home. somehow lately we are expecting a third wave but hopefully we're hoping it doesn't really reach us uh, we need to understand the direct and indirect effect of COVID-19 on each woman and men we need to deal with the reproduction reproductive health women are afraid to go uh, give birth at hospitals because there's a risk that hospitals are affected by the pandemic and all the hospitals, including uh, private hospitals in Yemen, are now open for, to, to receive uh, COVID-19 patients. So women are afraid to give birth in un, uh, uh, like unguaranteed circumstances or dangerous circumstances. Women are uh, calling for further support support for um, health care, decision making. Uh, domestic violence needs to be dealt with. 
For example, I'm a university teacher, but now I'm currently at home. Amid COVID-19, I could not attend. Oh, I, I could not. Uh, I could not, uh, you know, do the, the domestic chores at home. And I couldn't really recruit an assistant to help me in the uh, domestic chores at home. So now I'm doing both teaching and the domestic uh, chores, and I'm facing a lot of pressures. So as Dr. Balkis said, we have lost a lot of um, employment. Now when it comes to humanitarian assistance, we uh, demand fair assistance for women, equal assistance for women, and also equal participation of women in distribute, distributing such, uh, such assistance, also in granting confidence uh, in women in such a sphere. It is a free space where women have found uh, the ground to lead on uh, initiatives. And, and uh, like civil, civil society organizations led by women, be it humanitarian or legal or uh, developmental, uh, they were all led by women and, and there was no obstacle or any need to be appointed by the authorities to be present in such organizations. So being involved in such uh, organization was a safe space and a free space for women during COVID-19. As uh, Hannah said, there's a need to uh, engage uh, uh, security affiliated women in ceasefire. Uh, also in terms of decision making and also in terms of unifying the military in the national dialogue the weakest uh, uh, team uh, where women were present was the team on uh, on security and the army and uh, there were only two women and then they were excluded i don't know if this was intentional or co by coincidence but uh, but in yemen but Yemen has some security affiliated women and even the feminist religion has. So there's a need to engage women in, in such security affiliated peace building and ceasefire processes. And there's, there shouldn't be any exclusion of women. Women are also calling to, uh, to, uh, to kick out the, um, like the military bases from Yemen of foreign powers. These are the main points that uh, I have. And I leave the floor for those of you who want to ask me some questions or to enhance uh, what I've, uh, to add to what I've said. Thank you, Muzan, Bushra, Martha, and everyone who are interested in the Yemeni, uh, Yemeni cause. Before giving the floor to Marguerite, uh, there are some questions from our friends in Yemen. Uh, one of the main questions is that there's a, there's a demand that feminist uh, organizations have to have called for a report around gender-based violence and gender against women amid COVID-19. Is there a report about this? And another question that you might have uh, partially answered, but we need to know more about it. How do you, how did women co uh, communicate amid COVID-19 to reach the internal uh, regions in Yemen and to uh, reach like local communities in Yemen, provide them with assistance? Another question is, uh, amid uh, the war uh, on, on Yemen and the internal conflict, is there a role of of women uh, inside political parties to affect decision making and uh, and uh, reaching um, peace and recon reconciliation, civil peace and reconciliation? Uh, also, is there a difference in uh, the points of views? Uh, among the warring parties 
around the participation of women and granting them a role in the dialogue and the negotiations related to the security and the peace. And this is really important because uh, this is an opportunity. If there are some parties who encourage the, uh, the participation of women in, in such negotiations and in the peace building, then there is a need to to uh, valorize on uh, uh, such conflicts, uh, so, sorry, uh, such uh, parties. And if there are some uh, parties who reject uh, such efforts, then we might need to know them to reject them. So, so maybe, so maybe it's, uh, it's worth it to discuss uh, the needs and, and, what, and what these conflicting parties provide to like how they refuse the participation of women in peace building processes. Like what do they do to refuse the participation of women? Who wants to answer such questions from the friends present here? Is there a real demand by the UN Special Envoy and a report related to gender against uh, women uh, amid COVID-19 in Yemen? Is there a report? Who are the organizations who uh, who contributed to producing it? Also, what are the difficulties that women uh, have uh, faced in, in, in dealing with the local uh, or communities to provide assistance for women amid COVID-19 and to support such local uh, women? and to support them and to help them also, not only uh, on the level of COVID-19, but also in terms of saving them and protecting them from violence. And lastly, in terms of women's participation and decision-making and politics and uh, contradicting uh, opinions on women's participation in peace building and negotiations. Uh, and Tilaq, maybe, um, each one of you would answer one of the questions. So I will be talking about the role of women in the political parties. Of course, uh, political parties in Yemen have suffered, um, suffered uh, like fatality and the absence of role in the war. We don't see any, any strong, war, uh, strong role. Uh, done by them. In certain uh, periods, we have seen some statements being issued around the war in Yemen, etc. But there was no strong role for the political parties. Um, and so, political parties amid what Yemen is facing is, uh, like these political parties have the aim to reach the, the authorities power to be in power and also they play a role in serving uh, Yemeni state but these political parties are part of this, uh, of this, of this social Fabric. And uh, in regards to the role of women, women are suffering uh, what the political parties are also suffering. The main thing I want to mention is that, uh, is that the, the only participant in Stockholm was Rana Ghanem. Uh, Rana Ghanem was uh, the she was in the, in the one of the political parties. She was the head of the political party, the Nasiri uh, organization. And so, so women are really uh, putting so much effort to reach such uh, stages. And uh, honestly, her participation in negotiations was really remarkable. Around, uh, Important issues. So she was really active and remarkable in her participation. Uh, I can answer the question around the report. I already answered it. Uh, now I want to talk about the cluster related to uh, to violence. 
to gender-based uh, violence. So we are doing some meetings to produce this report. So we are now meeting and there is a survey where people uh, were getting answers around the violence and the COVID-19. Now this is in relation to violence. How can, how do women communicate? Uh, honestly, uh, in Yemen, there wasn't uh, like a complete quarantine or a complete uh, closure. Uh, in Yemen, um, maybe we got the immunity uh, of the shepherd. Um, the, the Yemeni people are uh, poor, they're in need of humanitarian assistance. So if, if, um, if, if we actually like, uh, stop everything, people would have died. So we couldn't have a complete closure. The women were capable of communicating. Um, a lot of women lost their lives from the healthcare system sector from both women and men. So war has lost us a lot of the best of our youth and also COVID-19 has lost us a lot of remarkable people. Now we have some uh, youth initiatives gathering medical doctors and actors, women actors who raise awareness. Uh, they take some like precautions, they communicate among each other. Um, COVID-19 spread in, in each Sana'a and Adan, but not in the suburbs of Yemen, not in the countryside of Yemen. So it was in Sana'a and Adan as the main cities, but in the, in the uh, rural area, it hasn't really spread uh, uh, and it would have been a real catastrophe if it, if it had spread there. Um, even like normal, dis like other uh, usual diseases who would take place there uh, are really, uh, like like their spread would be catastrophic. So those people who um, would go from Sana'a to Adan to do like a caesarean or a surgical operation, and they would die. Now, in relation to whether there is a disparity, as Dr. Balqis has mentioned, in the first round of negotiations, there, uh, one of the populist, um, populist uh, conferences, in, in Geneva II uh, conference, the, the, the government, uh, the formal government of Yemen, there were two women participating, uh, including Rana. So, and to date, no, uh, no woman has been appointed, although I believe that they have enough qualified women to participate. Is this just like a restriction by them? Is like a sort of extremism by them not to allow women to participate? by Ansar Allah. So, um, in terms of disparity, as the UN Special Envoy, the first and the second, have mentioned, Yemenis do not agree except for in the women, in the issues of women. This is what I have noticed as, uh, as a member in the committee for drafting the constitution. All the warring on all the political parties in Yemen, those the extreme and the non-extreme, all of them, they agree on the non-participation of women. So, um, because they consider that the society doesn't accept the participation.
أقول شكرا لكنا على التدخلات وما تمنيتيه أنت للنساء في اليمن نتمناه لكل النساء في المنطقة العربية وفي العالم يعني أن تكون بحقا النساء في مراكز القرار وليس فقط للعرض و للتبرير يعني وجودنا ان نكون حقا مشاركات في القرار على كل المستويات الداخليه والخارجيه. الكلمه الان للدكتوره مارجريت الحلو دكتوره في العلوم السياسيه بالجامعه الامريكيه بلبنان هي ستتكلم بصفه عامه على اثار الكوفيد على المراه على المراه ومدى تقايد خطط الاستجابه الوطنيه ومنها ستعطي الدكتوره ربما نظرة أو فكرة على ما يحصل في لبنان في هذا الموضوع بعلاقة بتوصيات الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة ومؤسسات الأمم المتحدة لجهة تعاتي مع مخاطر كورونا على المرأة وتعرضت لنا الصديقات في يمن حول الخصوصية التي تعيشها النساء بعلاقة بالكورونا والتي تستوجب قرارات عامة ولكن أيضا قرارات خصوصية بالنسبة لمناطق الصراع ومناطق الحرب. تفضل يا دكتورة. مساء الخير. وأشكر الزميلات العزيزات على دعوتي للمشاركة لإعطاء نوع من مقارنة مع اليمن. بالواقع لدى سماع ما قالته الزميلات عن ما يجري في اليمن نجد أنه المشاكل وأثار كوفيد-19 وأثار المشاكل الاقتصادية والمالية وغيرها كثير شبيهة بين لبنان واليمن ويمكن كمان مع باقي الدول العربية لكي لا أطيل Uh, in particular and in the world uh, more generally. And second, I will be talking about how um, how did Lebanon respond to COVID-19 and, uh, and the impact of COVID-19 on the political participation of women in Lebanon. Uh, as in Yemen, uh, COVID-19 spread in in Lebanon amid financial and economic uh, crisis, the dire economic and financial conditions in Lebanon. Also, uh, during a revolution that has been done by the people uh, to, to, uh, to fight against this, this financial, political, economic situation. And we have seen that during the revo Lebanese revolution, um, a very strong participation of women who, who were the main leaders and the main uh, 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 those who are chanting the slogans and working really hard. Now with the precautions against COVID-19, um, the revolution and the protests disappeared for a while and it took uh, with it uh, the voices of women. So what were the, uh, what was the impact of COVID-19 on women in Lebanon? Unfortunately, Although the Lebanese state was one of the states that uh, was quick in uh, implementing a, a, response, a national response plan to deal with COVID-19, uh, however, this plan was neutral. Uh, it did not uh, include a gender-sensitive approach and it did not really take into consideration what women might be facing from this plan. So, and, um, and two weeks after implementing this plan, we have uh, started to witness how this plan affected women. First of all, there was an increase in the level of violence against women. If we look at the reports uh, uh, published by the General Security Council and the different feminist and women organizations working on the protection of uh, women, of women who are victims of violence, we can see a huge is uh, in, in such uh, in such violence. So, um, based on the statistics of the internal security officers, uh, there was an increase in 62 percent uh, in comparison uh, with last year. So, 
uh, and then and then the, and this percentage decreased for the internal internal security, but but did not for the based on the statistics of other organizations such as Abad and Kafa and other local organizations that provide uh, protection oriented uh, services for women. Now this violence is affecting women economically and politically and uh, uh, psychologically and mentally. In addition to violence. Uh, 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 other risks against women were there. They might not appear now, but uh, they have. There, there are some some risks on the mid and long term. For example, risks on the level of employment, such as uh, risks for nurses, who constitute a huge part of the healthcare service. Um, now, uh, economic problems, women are subject to uh, being kicked off of their uh, employment, uh, of their uh, the jobs more than men. Now, on the level of households, they are being uh, uh, treated badly by men. If in case the men, uh, the salary of the men is uh, decreased or if the men uh, lose their jobs, so women are the victims. Uh, of the mood uh, of men and of the treatment by men. Also, there's a problem uh, which is electricity in Lebanon and long distance learning and access to the internet and access to uh, technology. And also uh, those who like internet providers did not really uh, stick to the, the services and the, uh, that the, the, the state has done in terms of providing internet. So women and young girls are really affected by these issues in such a space where uh, men are granted uh, bigger and more rights than women. Other risks include healthcare risks, uh, risks uh, such as rep reproductive health and sexual health for women and the inability to uh, the, to to access healthcare services in hospitals because uh, the state also has been announcing that uh, there's no, no need to go to the hospitals except for um, being affected by COVID-19. Um, so the state in Lebanon succeeded only in the first phase dealing with COVID-19, but now we're facing uh, um, like a huge increase and rapid increase in, in the number of affected people by COVID-19. Now, uh, with, the, with the ability of the state to uh, maybe um, like limit the spread of the COVID-19, the state did not really take into consideration uh, any recommendation by the UN Special uh, Envoy to uh, include uh, a gender-sensitive approach in the uh, uh, COVID-19 precautions knowing that uh, women are affected by COVID-19 differently than men. Uh, and, and at this stage, uh, some ministries and some initiatives by the civil society organizations and uh, UN agencies, especially UN agencies and other uh, international funders, came to, uh, to, uh, to deal with this lack. So they provided hotlines, uh, they dealt with uh, social distancing, they uh, enhanced the commitment to social distancing, provision of safe shelters, uh, because the, the available shelters uh, are, are really few, or uh, they were uh, uh, like uh, incapacitated, so there, there are no enough uh, capacities remaining to deal with the, with the new patients. Also, uh, one of the organizations, which is Abad, uh, with a fund by an international fund that was capable of renting an apartment to, uh, as a shelter for women, which was a great initiative. And also other efforts uh, for the, the, the National Committee for Women issues in partnership with other uh, ministries such as the uh, uh, Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, that uh, we're contributing to raising our awareness uh, on uh, the support of women and also of domestic workers because domestic workers in Lebanon are being subject to violence and this is really an issue in Lebanon. Now, this is in terms of the precautions. To what extent can we, uh, can we determine the 
the impact of COVID-19 on the political participation of women in Lebanon. Here, let me say that there is a difficulty in separating between pre- and post-COVID-19. Women in Lebanon, their political participation, the political participation of women in Lebanon, positions um, and so the only real place that women have been really involved in a lot is uh, the legal level before COVID-19 there were some protests and demonstrations and revolutionary acts where women and young ladies uh, participated actively and they were the main speakers uh, calling for the demands but unfortunately, based on previous uh, experiences, this is not called for uh, an optimism because if we take uh, like the old feminist movements, historical feminist movements, we always notice that uh, women are in the front lines um, uh, of demonstrations and uh, sit-ins. They always talk, uh, uh, give speeches, and, and they are... Uh, like uh, like they, they work hard so that other protesters do not get hurt or beaten up by the security officers but unfortunately we see that when um when there are some elections or appointment there are no uh, there are no uh, uploading acts uh, that show any gratitude for women's efforts Although in the last years, we had some women being appointed as uh, like deputies uh, for political parties or executive directors uh, for, for political parties and also consultants for, uh, for the government in the times of Saad al-Hariri. Uh, but we see that in the times of the elections, women do not reach uh, decision-making positions. And here I need to, uh, to, to, to compare uh, the situation to Yemen. I was reading in one of the articles on Yemen that uh, showing, showing the, 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 the people do desire to reach uh, decision-making positions in Yemen. And then in Lebanon, uh, women as well, uh, like the women in Yemen, do uh, really desire to reach decision-making. And, and, and we have like a 70% uh, uh, based on surveys, 70% of people approve women's uh, access to decision-making. But such a support is not really being uh, being uh, translated uh, into uh, tangible uh, uh, like outputs in elections. Women are not being appointed by political parties. When those who want to elect are in the in the like uh, they are in the the place for for voting in the voting room. They do not find the names of women. Although, although people want to elect women, they go to vote and don't find the names of women on the lists of people that they can vote to. And here comes the flak role of women inside the political parties. So women need to work harder to pressure their political parties to acknowledge the importance of their participation in representing their political parties and taking decision-making positions within their political parties and this is a real issue that needs to be dealt with to increase the participation of women also women have been excluded from from all national dialogue sessions previously in Yemen and also same in Lebanon. This is the same case in Lebanon. Women are being excluded for, from all the reform related sessions in Lebanon uh, that, that deal with like uh, fixing the, like dealing with the financial and economic and 
situation in Lebanon, people now are uh, being threatened with, their, with losing their bread, uh, despite all the support that is being provided for the most vulnerable families in Lebanon. And uh, that the social uh, Ministry of Social Affairs uh, are, are, are providing some assistance to women-led families and households, but poverty is uh, increasing further and further in Lebanon. Now, in terms of COVID-19, in COVID amid COVID-19, voices became louder to put an end to violence against women. Uh, the uh, implementation of the resolution 1325 uh, was promulgated by the uh, government. There is an insistence in implementing this resolution to put an end to violence against women and the importance of promoting the role of Lebanese women in, 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 in being represented. There's a need for Lebanese women to uh, further uh, uh, further uh, ask for the right to being represented in decision-making uh, capacities. I don't know what the revolution will result in, but there's a really uh, an urgent need for the increase of women participation. So whenever we listen to young women and ladies um, who, who, who show uh, like the frauderies in, in, in the financial sectors, we always are astonished why such really hardworking women are being excluded from appointment and elections when it comes to elections. So now this call is directed to um, Lebanese women to push harder uh, for, their, for their representation, even amid the threat of, um, like, like for example, they can threaten to uh, to, to uh, abandon the elections um, so that they get what they want. They need to push, put some pressures. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Marguerite. Yes, we need to, to, to think uh, about the future. Like, what, what can we do in the future? So, in terms of Lebanon, first of all, there is a need for laws that protect women from violence. This is a basic uh, demand uh, related to all Arab countries. Um, this is not the case for all Arab countries is in like the same level but on different levels this is uh, really important um, and just like in Yemen where we have like public policies uh, but other uh, also like uh, uh, like different uh, policies related to uh, executive tribunals and also those that are based on discrimination between men and women. Also, the second point is about, is about the importance of the participation of women uh, in all different levels for both Yemen uh, and, uh, and the different other Arab countries that are in peace. So there's a need for women participation in peace in Yemen, but also in other related uh, fields in, in the remaining Arab countries. So that women uh, in the Arab world are empowered, they're uh, participating truly. Now, what's also evident is that uh, any participation in any national strategy to uh, to implement law, resolution number 1325, there's a huge need for it. There's a huge need to find plans uh, for, for Arab states to promulgate the resolution 1325 and to implement it. So I think that today 
we need to understand our role as women in politics to support women in Yemen. What type of support can we provide women in Yemen? So now, Yemeni women know the type of support that they need and that might have a positive impact and that we can we can we might be mistaken uh, if, if we're really too too enthusiastic in knowing what type of support they need but they will not be mistaken Yemeni women know the right uh, situation in Yemen and the, and the the reality in Yemen and they need and they also know what to expect from other Arab women to support them. So I think this is something that we need to discuss. So whoever wants to participate, please let me know. Who wants to add something? Antilaq, uh, would you like me to add something related to decisions, to policies? Uh, it's really important to talk more about the laws, uh, especially based on what I understood um, during the last phase. Uh, there was no, uh, uh, there was like things were really hard in, 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 in like uh, supporting women and, and helping them. There was, there were no, uh, enough mechanisms to to provide uh, assistance to women. Now, in terms of Yemeni uh, laws, uh, some are neutral. They don't really support men or women. So, uh, on the level of the constitution and laws, On the level of the new constitution, the new constitution in Yemen provides uh, the uh, the Yemeni uh, decision maker, the guarantee uh, based on the Sharia law, like they follow the Sharia law. Uh, now, after the civil law that took place in 1994 in Yemen, uh, between two uh, systems, uh, it resulted in amending the constitution. So the, the issues uh, related to women were left for the legislator to decide on them. Now the legislators differ based on provinces, regions. Some legislators would agree to provide further um, equality for women uh, in comparison to men, but others don't. But now in the Islamist uh, culture, that the, the constitution uh, uh, derives from, uh, so it's based on Islamic values. Um, the constitution says that the president needs to be a male and the, this has been, uh, so this particular uh, article was, diff was later amended and the constitution draft that hasn't been uh, implemented uh, in a final way, but there were some outputs that uh, guarantee the participation of women in no less than 30% capacity on all political, social, and economic levels in the, in the state. And even in, the, in, in, what, in what comes to laws. In addition to other articles that were amended uh, that uh, actually victimize violence, um, so and also uh, things related to reproductive health as well. So some some of the articles were were 
were transferred, uh, were kept in the constitution and the draft of the new constitution, but others were changed. Now, uh, now, as you said, uh, there's one law that has so much discrimination against women, which is uh, the panel code. The panel code is very discriminatory against women. It has around 200 women that are really con uh, discriminatory against women, and they also contradict with um, international ratifications uh, that uh, Yemen has uh, ratified. So there's a contradiction uh, between what Yemen, like, for example, Yemen has ratified the CEDAW uh, agreement, but has uh, only uh, by, the, uh, by one article although it endorsed it and ratified it. So there are so many articles that require uh, to be amended in the panel code uh, in relation to honor uh, killings. Uh, for example, one of the laws uh, don't really uh, like they consider that honor killings are allowed and the man would only be put in the prison for five years if they commit honor killings. Now, in terms of personal status laws, personal status laws are at the heart of daily basis uh, life of women. It has so many articles that are uh, discriminatory against women in a very clear way. Some of the articles of the personal status law were um, were amended. Uh, so, for example, there's one article that says that the women are not allowed to go out without the having the, uh, taking the agreement of their husband to go out. So, for example, some women are are late to go. Uh, to the hospital to give birth because uh, they were supposed to take the permission from their husband or any other male in their family. And this has affected the health of women. And this is something that needs to be, uh, you know, like uh, changed amid COVID-19 because some women's husbands are, are outside the country. So this text needs to be amended. Imagine, there's a text in the Yemeni constitution saying that women cannot go out without taking the permission of their husband or another male relative. Another uh, article is about early uh, marriages, early age marriages. The, the legal age for marriages of uh, young girls is 15. This also needs to be amended in Yemen. Oh, it was actually uh, it was actually amended. So they took out the, the mention of the age. They took out 15 years old, but they left it open without mentioning the the, uh, the the minimum age for marriages, which has led to a lot of early marriages, especially amid the war, because um, a lot of families cannot uh, face poverty, so they would uh, uh, allow the marriage of their daughters, young daughters, especially if they are displaced. They would, uh, for example, uh, uh, marry their daughter to a sheikh, uh, for example, because they think this is how they would protect them. Also, in the personal status law, there is a need to review it fully. There is a need to fully review the personal status laws in Yemen in order to make it more just. So this is a verse from the Quran uh, that says that there is a need for gender equality. Uh, so yeah, we need to, uh, the Yemen needs to make sure that it, is, it abides by the international ratifications that has endorsed. There's a need to be uh, gender sensitive 
in all the laws. For example, there is a special law related to uh, AIDS. It needs to take into consideration gender-sensitive approach and to have some provisions on women in particular. And other uh, laws need to take into consideration the importance of providing full health care services for women. This is in general in terms of Yemeni laws that we hope the Constitution later on will uh, amend them in light of, of, of the articles that uh, that the public has discussed in the national dialogue. The national dialogue included 600 people from the different Yemeni regions, both rural and urban, and women were actively participating in that. And we discussed all the discriminatory articles and laws that need to be amended. So we hope that uh, as the civil society actors and feminist actors discussed those articles, we hope they would be amended. There's a full report about all the discriminatory um, articles and laws that need to be amended. For example, early, early age marriage laws is still a uh, is still a point of conflict among the different uh, warring parties because it's something that is related to women. And to this date, the parliament has not, has not ended, has not put an end to early marriages. So, so the, the constitution still allows early marriages. So there's a need for a better reading uh, of the uh, international laws related to children uh, that uh, do not allow the, the marriage of 18 year old uh, kids. And to this day, we, ha we are uh, hosting young girls whom their parents would uh, give them to, to people to marry them who are much older than them. So we've heard so many painful stories that really need to be put in a legal context. And whenever we are uh, consulting some lawyers, uh, there's uh, no way for them to, to, to do anything because the laws actually provide the permission for early marriages. So there is a real need to amend such laws. For example, women in Yemen are not allowed to go into tribunes and for example, if a young lady or woman go and ask for its right to inheritance in a tri tribunal, uh, they're not allowed to. Thank you. بس أنا أنا حضيف على ما قالته زميلتي الدكتورة انطلاق أنه القرار مجلس الأمن 22/16 هذا القرار الذي حدد أطراف الصراع وحدد ما هي المرجعيات التي يمكن أن تبنى عليها عمليات بناء السلام في القرار 22/16 تبع مخرجات الحوار الوطني the main output of the national dialogue in terms of the transition from the transition الحوار الوطني كانت النساء تتابع قضيتين أساسيتين كانت تتابع قضية إعطاء كوتا أو نسبة 30% على الأقل للنساء في مراكز صنع القرار وفي المجالس المنتخبة وفي كل مراكز صنع القرار في البلد والقضية الثانية هي قضية زواج الصريح هاتان القضيتان uh, yeah. يعني, uh, These two uh, issues were really critical in the national dialogue and uh, as a result of uh, the difference of the women and their fights, they were capable of uh, 
لكن بعد بعد مباشرة في Thank you. Thank you. So there's a question that has been uh, asked. Who wants to answer it? So it says that on the uh, Al Masira channel, which is affiliated with one of the warring parties, we find a big uh, participation of women, especially on the media level and uh, uh, mobilization level. So how do you evaluate this role and what are the roles of women with other uh, parties? Is the, is the question clear? Who wants, to, uh, who wants to answer the question? Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, so this role is uh, still being played by, uh, by, by women through mobilization in the media. So this is the role of women who are part of uh, conflicting parties and they were playing this role uh, during the elections um, women are being uh, used as voters but then at the elections they are not being reported um, so when it comes to mobilization and when it comes to issues that are in the interest of the politicians, so uh, they would be using women in the media and in their mobilization efforts. So this is one of the main problems that women are still suffering from in Yemen. Who wants to add to this answer? Who wants to answer this question as well? Uh, so this role, when we need women, when we need when we need when we when we need women, we we find the, their importance. When the political parties feel that they need women in elections or in the jihad or anything, so then they would support women. This is only when they support, even in the Arab Spring, this is only when they support women. The political party supports women when it's in their interest. Muzan, can you also answer, please? Uh, 
can you please uh, clarify uh, the questions through some of the recommendations that would uh, be serve as a basis for us to look at thank you Bushra thank you everyone thank you the participants uh, honestly uh, meeting is really uh, going great on different levels and I think that in most uh, the discussions we agreed on first the importance of uh, having uh, laws that protect women uh, in reference to some discriminatory laws that need to be amended uh, when talking about the constitution and the national dialogue uh, so we have some we are wondering uh, we don't want to do something that uh, that is not the right thing for the Yemeni women so can we work on the legal uh, aspect of laws in Yemen in parallel with the peace building process or should we wait uh, for each individually and the second point is the political participation of women in Yemen. I, uh, it's an inspirational uh, uh, experience, the Yemeni experience for women in the Arab world, um, including all their struggle in the past years, just to be present and, and active uh, in comparison with other uh, experiences in the region. Uh, so in, in the region, uh, that is uh, mostly going through conflict, only to uh, so uh, the question is, what's what's the what's the, uh, the destiny of this uh, struggle uh, for for women in politics, uh, mobilizing uh, international mobilization for women? Um, so I know there are so many different uh, women in Yemen, but they are uh, in agreement on a specific. Uh, specific basic uh, values so we only need to uh, we only need the panelists to tell us what they need from us and to link this with uh, the empowerment strategy political empowerment strategy and uh, resolution number 1325 so i think that the political uh, the political realm and uh, like the outputs of the dialogue all need to contribute to not using and exploiting women in the public realm i do understand this but i'm still very proud to be part of the feminist movement in this region that understands really well that we're being exploited but we are being but we are cooperating and are in solidarity with with each other so that um, there uh, there's a political presence uh, for us uh, so we don't really like to play the role of victims, but uh, we are fighters. We don't wait someone to, to give us our rights. So I think, so I think the main two, uh, two uh, paths uh, for the local uh, development is the public political path second of all what you need from us uh, to provide you with uh, so that this dialogue uh, will be listened to by other people and we would like to work on it in the caucus as being members of the caucus we really would like you to tell us how we can uh, improve and uh, promote this and support um, feminists and uh, women in the region and in Yemen, how we can learn from each other and empower each other and to have a strong feminist movement in the region. Who wants to add something? I think that if, if any of you would like to add something, Marguerite wanted to say something. I would like to add uh, a hope based on our uh, experience in Lebanon, if possible, about legislations and the importance of legislating uh, based on uh, 
the, the development of uh, the uh, conditions in Lebanon and discrimination against women in Lebanon, we can notice that things are being partial. There is no uh, uh, fully oriented approach. It's all a partial approach. They would, um, for example, amend a law, and then we would find that they, uh, that for example, we abolished the law that uh, that uh, supports honor crimes. It, this law has been abolished, uh, but then we kept another uh, article in the same law that uh, allows that allows the uh, the effect of the, the act on honor crimes. So we need uh, we, we call for the the amendment of all the laws that discriminate against women. We have uh, amended the law on domestic violence and women. Also, there's a contradiction between this law and other articles and laws. So, so we need to abolish all the laws all the articles, there is a need for a comprehensive approach that takes into consideration all the articles and all the, all the laws that are interrelated in terms of women's rights. And, and Bushra, I really applaud your efforts in Tunisia, in Tunisia and in, in your work uh, in, in, in abolishing the articles uh, that uh, discriminate, discriminate against women. Now, the second point, is uh, the religious and sectarian pressure and the en engagement uh, of the political interests and private interests when it comes to women. Because in Lebanon, personal status laws are held by religious courts and sectarian courts. So how can we merge uh, like women's rights with like religious uh, studies on, on personal status? Thank you. So, Maryam Ismail would like to intervene. So, Maryam Ruai would like to talk now. هل ممكن الأستاذة مريم تكتب السؤال لو Can Maryam write down the question if she cannot speak? مرحبا مرحبا Hello آه, okay. آه, صوتي مسموع إذا سمحتي Can you all hear me? Okay. السلام عليكم أنا سعيدة جدا برؤية كل الصديقات وشكرا للمداخلات العميقة حقيقة والمفيدة أنا سألت سؤالين وجاوبتني عليهم يعني كتابة لكن أحب أضيف أن يعني نفس المشاكل اللي اذكروها بالنسبة حق التشريع هي موجودة في كل بلداننا تقريبا يعني يعني في قوانين أحوال شخصية حقيقة موجود القانون لكن مثل ما ذكرت الاستاذه قوانين نعم مريم there is some noise around you so it's really hard to hear you well اوكي سوري سوري اي ان شاء الله يعني انا احاول اقول يعني ان لو سمحت ودي ودي يعني في قضية مشتركة واللي هي القوانين التمييزية أنا أسفة جدا على الصوت اللي موجود يعني صح قوانين موجودة لكنها قوانين يعني تمييزية تمس حياة النساء ويعانون منها على أرض الواقع يعني نفس الواقع اللي ذكرت الأستاذ انطلاق عن قانون الأحوال الشخصية إحنا في البحرين نعاني مع النساء تعاني معاناة شديدة في المحاكم من يعني تطبيقات القانون على أرض الواقع خاصة أن قانون يستند إلى المذاهب وفقا للمذهب الجعفري وفقا للمذهب السني فأعتقد أن الحل هو 
يعني وجود تحالف يعني على مستوى الوطن العربي لوضع قوانين يعني حاليا مثلا قيادة اتحاد المرأة الأردنية يوجد تحالف لقانون الأحوال الشخصية المدني مؤسسة في لبنان كفا وضعوا قانون الحماية من العنف لأن دائما قوانين الحماية من العنف اللي موجودة عندنا في بلداننا يعني تغفل الكثير من الأمور مو موجودة ولا تستفيد النساء من تطبيقات فممكن نعتمد قانون مثلا القانون اللي يعني قد يكون القانون التونسي قد يكون القانون اللي حطته مؤسسة كفا عن لأنه بمشاركة عدد كبير من الأطراف العربية المجتمع المدني ويتم تبني ويتم رفعه للجامعة العربية أيضا تركيز على تركيز على مسألة الفتيات يعني حاليا وملاحظ وبرز هذا الشيء خلال جائحة كورونا يعني نحن نتكلم عن النساء ولا نتكلم عن الفتيات وبرز الكثير من العنف الممارس على الفتيات يعني في إطار الأسرة يعني شفنا مثلا في فلسطين شفنا في الأردن إحنا عندنا في البحرين برزت كذا حالة يعني وصارت جرعة عند الفتيات إنه يتكلمون على وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي فإحنا في حاجة أيضا إنه نركز على يعني هذه النوع من القضايا أنا بختم إنه أشكر الصديقات الأستاذة الدكتورة بلقيس والأستاذة انطلاق صراحة يعني والأستاذة مزن استفدنا كثير اليوم أن ملتقى النساء فكر أنه يعقد على زوم خاصة أن نحن حضرنا يعني لقاءات لكثير من الأطراف كانت مفيدة وكانت هذه خطوة إيجابية جدا أخذها الملتقى ونتمنى يعني نختار أي مواضيع كما اخترنا اليوم هذا الموضوع الهام وأنا ودي أسمع الأخوات اليمنيات شنو يعني ماذا يعتقدون أن نحن ممكن أن نقدم؟ يعني هذه نقطة رئيسية نبي قبل نقاش يعني من وجهة نظرهم يقولون لنا يعني وأعتقد كل أبوات الملتقى على الاستعداد يعني المساهمة بما يرونه هم مفيدة So Bushra, you need to please unmute yourself. Thank you for all those who have uh, contributed to the organization, to the follow-up. Um, I feel that uh, people are really uh, requesting more meetings such as this one to, to discuss the issues uh, of women. In the Arab region, what is happening is super important, but what's more important is for us to sustain it, to sustain this discussion between us, to find real mechanisms to support, uh, for mutual support. Uh, for example, to learn from the Tunisian uh, experience, as Marguerite has mentioned, uh, through the, the, the Tunisian uh, Mission case is a case that we're really proud of, but it hasn't really been easy. It took tens of, like a ten, ten year uh, long struggle for us to reach it. Um, the most important thing is to start. When we start and when we have a clear vision that we want a comprehensive law that that uh, provide uh, precautions, protections, and solidarity for women and to help them. We need to first talk about precautions. We need to see what are the types of violence. We need to see what types of violence these women are being subject to. Is it domestic violence? Is it political violence? Is it economic violence? 
um, in the Yemeni uh, experience today, we feel that um, what women are living on the level of economic discrimination and the difficulty of accessing uh, work uh, opportunities and the economic independence, all these issues require lots of efforts and coordination among feminist organizations and partnerships with uh, with local authorities uh, to reach this to reach uh, that is the needed results and to build uh, the needed channels such as participatory channels and dialogues thank you so much um, i hope to meet you all soon uh, be it directly face to face or uh, online um, uh, this this has been like a way for us to breathe amid COVID-19 thank you so much can, can we talk about the main demand for the young women of course I will uh, ask the caucus, and I know that the caucus includes women from all the Arab region. The main uh, issue for us is to stop the war in Yemen because it has taken a lot from us. It has taken our fortunes in Yemen, which is the use. It has taken the infrastructure. It has taken education. Education has stopped the future that we were hoping for. So each member in the caucus I hope she can exert some pressure or even political, uh, you know, pressure to stop the war in Yemen. Uh, sisters in the Arab Gulf, please, for example, Maryam, can you talk to people in the Emirates or Sheikha Fatima in Emirates to stop the war in Yemen? Um, can uh, uh, Sister Al Arwa in Saudi Arabia meet with uh, meet with Muhammad Salman to uh, Prince uh, to to find the right solutions for the crisis, and even in in Jordan and in Egypt, and in the entire uh, in the entire uh, region, we are not finding a real role for the Arab countries in the Yemeni war. We need your support to, uh, to, to like uh, gather all the Yemeni, uh, all the warring parties to, to reach a civil state in Yemen, modern state, and to end war. Can we, can all of us here, all the members talk to uh, talk to decision makers in the Arab world was an end to war. For us as women, I think the most important thing for us is that war find an end so that we can stand up again as women. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for your interest. In Yemeni. أنا كنت عايزة أتكلم في نقطتين كيف ممكن مساعدتنا نحن النساء اليمنيين أو حتى مساعدتنا النساء في المنطقة العربية يعني أنا عندي مقترح أنه هل هل في إمكانية لعمل يعني خطة وطني مش خطة وطنية لكن مقترحات خطط لتنفيذ القرار 1325 على الأقل في دول الصراع كيف نستطيع أن نحن في اليمن لدينا خطة لكنها للأسف لم تفعل أو يعني العديدة كل يعني بشق من ال من ال يعني بشق من الخطة من القرار 1325 
related to the 1325. So, um, so, and so many, like, uh, so many of what uh, the women in Yemen are doing, we need, uh, we need to learn from other experiences and to know how Yemeni women can really make an impact. We have participated in negotiations. We are in the conversations uh, uh, with the UN Special Envoy. We work in the political process. We are in civil society organizations. Yemeni women uh, went to the UN Security Council to provide presentations and talk and meet with members of the UN. UN Security Council. So we are actually working a lot with the UN Security Council and we are doing a lot of things with the UN Ambassadors those who are in the Yemeni Christian, but Yemeni women are not really yet in the impact phase. So how can we learn from all that we are doing to make an impact? Second of all, in the political path, we have so many different visions. Uh, we have developed some visions that we mostly, uh, most of the women agreed on. And maybe the caucus can, you know, disseminate them and uh, be played the role of the facilitator to support uh, the women in Yemen to reach any issue we need or regional or internal local level. So we really need the support of all Arab women to stop the war, as Dr. Tilak has mentioned. War has taken all our lives and supports and lots of suggestions. And it's just not about what we want, but also about how Arab women can help other experiences and lessons learned, how we can learn from you and reach certain so I thank you all. I thank Bushra, I thank the interpreter. Thank you for this discussion. And I hope we can further develop it around other issues involving Yemeni women. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the suggestions. We're uh, together all the time, but also uh, in, in the caucus as part of our plan for 2020. Uh, we wanted to work on the 1325 resolution that COVID-19 came, but we will continue working around this uh, even post pandemic. And as Dr. Antilaq has mentioned, the discussion uh, to be held by everyone, uh, be it collectively or uh, individually, are also like exerting pressure collectively to put an end uh, to war is are among the most important things that we all, as members in the caucus and members of the Arab uh, region, uh, and like active women in the Arab region need to focus on. At the end, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you for the speakers. We will be continuing this um, discussion. Our groups go to Yemen, Sudan, Syria for, for, the, for peace. Um, our hopes go to all the women in the region, in Egypt, for our colleagues in Saudi Arabia uh, to be freed uh, from prisons, um, to gain back their freedom, such as Lujain. We haven't heard anything about her, so I hope we can all spread more information and, and raise more awareness about the, the fact that she is in Saudi Arabia and the prisons from two years ago with um, with so many different other women who have fought for the um, for the for the rights of women also our uh, Sulaf Abdel Fattah and, and Hussein Mu'niz and so many others in Egypt and in the region I hope that all the detainees 
uh, live like or or uh, read again. Thank you so much. I learned a lot from you. I always learn from you when I hear you. Thank you for all those who are behind the scenes and who organized this meeting. My friends, uh, the volunteers in the caucus, uh, the friend who is uh, helping in the logistical part, who helped us to be present here, the colleague uh, who's interpreting, all those who are behind the scenes uh, and do not appear for different reasons. Thank you so much. And without them, we wouldn't have really succeeded in this. Thank you so much and peace. Bye-bye.